It's the Hero Show. Welcome to the Hero Show, everybody. Starring the irrepressible Andrew Bernstein and the the relentless Robert Begley. I am Andrew Bernstein, and you are indubitably Robert Begley. How you doing today, Robert? I am doing great, Andy. Ready to talk about oh, one of my favorite subjects: going back in time to Greek art and the heroism. Yes. Perfect for the hero show, right? Oh, it absolutely, it absolutely is. And we have the author of the of this great book, Windows on Humanity. You know the 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 story of of art over over the age, ages. Here we have uh, a woman who's uh, Sandra Shaw, who is a accomplished sculptress, art historian, philosopher, beautiful woman, all around Renaissance person. Oh. Welcome to the Hero Show, Sandra Shaw. Hello, 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 Robert. Great to see yes. you. Thank you Great for joining day. us. Yes, you've got my beautiful book in in in. Uh, that's the paperback from Amazon. Is that right? Yes. 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 Yeah. yes. And I've got uh, a rare in hardcover, which is available at uh, WindowsOnHumanity.com. Gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. I'm thrilled with the quality. Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's. I'm really happy to hear that, Sandra, because it's a it, the the it's a great work on, on art history, and so you know you're you're thank the you. perfect person. Oh uh, yeah, well thank you for writing. Uh, so, it's a great so idea. Good. It's yeah. a great idea to trace history and show the relationship between a culture and its art. You know, we we know the expression politics is downstream from culture. Well, by simply looking through the art, which Sandra does a fabulous job, chron she chronologically goes from the ancient eras up to before the medieval, the fall of Rome is basically what she yes. does in the book. But for, Sandra, can we ask why why this book? Sure. Why, um, how? Just give us some backstory on your motivation for the book as a starter, please. Well, I've, I've never been able to leave this subject alone. It's, it's like an addiction. I'm fascinated <laughs> by um, most broadly the history of ideas uh, and, and I love art. And over the years, I noticed this correlation. It can't be incidents. Uh, that you, you have certain philosophical ideas um, uh, in a culture, and lo and behold, the art uh, reflects it. And uh, so that it was just a natural, uh, I mean, I became curious about it. Um, I certainly was inspired by Marianne Suri's uh, article, Metaphysics in Marble, that really yes, opened the, objectivist. the door for me intellectually. Uh, she mm -hmm. treated the the issue of of uh, sculpture, and uh, I never thought of uh, the history of art the same way after that. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, Peter Laporte invited me to to write about it. Uh, he was familiar with my lectures and whatnot, and um, I ended up uh, doing a draft uh, covering from uh, prehistory to modern times. Uh, so I actually have a draft of volume two uh, done, and and just time wise, we decided, well, let's just do till the fall of Rome, and mm -hmm. and see what that looks like, and book out there, and get it into people's hands, and see what that. Uh, but I have a, a second volume uh, in in wow. the works, and I also wrote a draft of a third volume on architecture. Who mm -hmm. knows if I'll oh. get to that, but. Uh, yeah, but at any rate, great. so that uh, that's so that's that's okay. great, Sandra. Yeah, if you tried to do that yes. all in one volume, it would be massive. Yeah, you, you, you know, no, you five hundred pages it. just never see yeah. it again. I would just be off somewhere <laughs> working on it. All right. So yeah, I'm have, sorry. I'm, I was. I'm sorry. I was just going to say five hundred pages yeah, for right. volume one. So yeah, you want to get something right. out there for yes. the public to absorb. yes. And I must say that the. Um, the near 500 pages, half of that is images. So I really tried to yes. keep, I tried to keep it manageable because, you know, we have these lovely uh, art history surveys that are already available with, you know, encyclopedic detail on everything, but they're massive tomes. 
and uh, uh, I find them to be unmanageable. So I really did everything I could to pare it down to essentials. I do get fairly detailed in some of the descriptions, but for the most part, um, I, I, I tried to keep it uh, at a manageable size for the reader, for the sake of the reader. Uh, absolutely. I mean, you keep going pretty soon, you're going to be like Will and Ariel Durant, you know, the story of civilization in 11 massive volumes, which is great, by the way. Yeah, I don't want to go there. Yes. No. <laughs> mm. Well, the story of civilization is great, you know, for its comprehensive scope oh. in the field of history. But, mm -hmm. but, um, and, and so well absolutely. written by, by, by the, by the Durants. But we, yeah, yes, didn't necessarily yes, I love that, that, that series. Yeah, me too. Me too. Uh, you don't necessarily want eleven volumes on, you know, on on all. You know, two, I think uh, two well, or three I, volumes I really, will. will I wanted to aim might, might for be, might, might um, uh, readers who know nothing about this topic and are not necessarily Perfect. bookish, and and uh, mm -hmm. um, it, it's it's accessible writing. It's not um, academic in style. It's um, uh, something that a, even a, um, a senior high school student could gain value from, and certainly college level, but also adults, adults who want to teach themselves. And I, I think that this would be very good for um, homeschoolers uh, to mm -hmm. educate themselves about it before they say anything to their child about uh, art. Um, so I, th I think it has a, a, a potential of broad readership and, and right. you can't I, get that with a 20 volume you know history of right. uh, mm -hmm. english people yeah. or what you know that that kind of thing uh is is just so big a commitment on the part of the reader yeah also that's, i designed that's, that's only the, the content to be what you could browse you, you know you can jump right in anywhere um, the sections have uh, comprehensive uh, uh, headers, uh, so, you, so you pretty much kind of cherry pick what what interests you, and and that makes it much more manageable for you know college students who don't have a lot of time, uh, homeschoolers who just want to get cut to the chase about a particular uh, or, or issue. Uh, so right. Mm -hmm. College students don't have a lot of time because they're too busy partying. You don't want to interrupt. You don't want to interrupt the essentials of college <laughs> life for them. And reading so, vast and, amounts of nonsense if they're in the humanities. Uh, oh yeah, that's that's painful. Okay, true. so let's let's. Uh, this is going to be a visual uh, show. We're going to be yes, sharing some yes, artwork yes. Uh, from the book, and because it's a chronology, I thought Sandra, we would start with the pre-Greeks. What was art like, and uh, before the Greeks? So. Elliot, if we could bring up the first slide and just let's talk oh, yes. a couple of ideas. What do you see and what uh, what is essentialized? I mean, I think one of the, your premises, Sandra, is that art portrays a view of humans, of man, of human nature. And let's talk about this from, from that perspective. We could start, uh, you could name the works and then give uh, yeah, and, and who, who, your who is this? Where? What, what country or what part uh, of the world yeah, the, the, um, the re These are two what we call relief panels. They're not sculptures in the round. They're carved onto us. The one on the left is Egyptian. It's, it's uh, a relief on what we call the Narmer palette, which was a ritualistic uh, cosmetics uh, palette. Um, the one on the, on the right is, is, uh, is in a Near Eastern uh, portrayal of a hero uh, with a lion, um, and uh, uh, that is a, an Assyrian piece, uh, quite large. I, I don't know how many feet tall that is, but that's a very large work. Uh, so, I mean, these are two from two different cultures, um, and um, we see that uh, their treatment of the figure is is very s static. Um, the figure seem kind of frozen, robotic, uh, even though the figure on the left, uh, who, who uh, I believe is a, a pharaoh uh, smiting the enemy, um, even though mm -hmm. he's taking action, we're not really convinced that 
someone with a bot could actually take any action. If you notice the formula for the, for the, the figure uh, on, on the left, the chasing toward us, the legs are, are in profile and the head is in profile. So it's, it's a really strangely twisted uh, body and it looks very stiff and robotic. So features that were not that were not uh, uh, ambitious about uh, learning about human beings, man's nature, what his potential is on Earth, uh, what he's capable of, and, and those kinds of concerns are critically important for portraying the heroic uh, in mm -hmm. art. And these were cultures who stuck to these formulas. In the case of uh, Egypt, they stuck to that formula for three thousand years uh and uh, in the case well, it was of, tried and true uh, well it was tried and true that right it was tried <laughs> and true in that case <laughs> for three thousand years well you know it was based on authority which um uh you know is is really damaging to to artists in terms of a uh, rob of the independence to innovate and, and to work firsthand based on their uh, observation of nature so it makes, because these were top-down cultures, uh, uh, theocracies, basically, um, artists were really uh, uh, not encouraged uh, to, to change art. Um, right. And these works had uh, primarily religious significance. Uh, on the figure on the right um, might be uh, King Gilgamesh. Uh, he certainly modeled on the... Uh, the Mesopotamian myth uh, of uh, King Gilgamesh, who, as far as I know, was the first hero in Western literature. But as you can see, uh, they they were very limited in their ability to portray him. Um, let now, me, as let far me as you, let um, me ask you something, let me ask you something, Sandra. Yeah. Because that dude on the right looks like he captured a house cat. Not a lion. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> the scale, the scale of it is 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 it is it very heroic? Yeah, is it very heroic? Right, right, <laughs> right. Because they had a view of uh, they express a, a a view of the heroic as consisting of physicalistic might, muscular might, the ability to to grapple with and kill lions barehanded that's as the myth goes mm -hmm. like, and wow. uh, so they wanted to portray yeah. the uh, the hero as bigger than the cat but of course it's completely unrealistic right. and uh, because uh, they were focused mm -hmm. on reality mm -hmm. I, I, that, so, that's, to, that's a good point to yeah. transition <clears throat> i, I want to yes. just read uh, before we go to the greeks Page 166, you have this great quote from Plato. Uh, he says, in Egypt, oh. it was and still is forbidden to painters and all other producers of postures and representations to introduce any innovation or invention. You will find the things depicted or graven there 10,000 years ago. And I mean, literally 10,000 years ago and no whit better or worse than the productions of today, but wrought with the same art. So you just mentioned you mentioned the word innovation, Sandra. So if we could yes. transition yeah, to the me, innovation. Let me jump in here. Interesting that a, yeah. that a Greek yeah, guys. philosopher noticed about these other cultures. And no wonder the Greeks referred to them as barbarians. Yeah, and let me let me point out here, that's rich coming from Plato, who intends to censor the art <laughs> once he... Yeah. he well, in his laws, goes, in, his, in Plato's yeah. laws, which and is, I, yeah, like a totalitarian setup. You're, you're right. Yeah, the irony the is... Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the Republic... I think, I think let's it move might on. have been Herodotus who noticed that the, uh, that the Egyptians were religious in excess. Mm-hmm. So they, the, the, the Greeks really uh, figured out who their neighbors were. Yeah. So how about we switch over now to the transition yeah. coming, coming uh, towards the, the Kuro, Greek era. Oh, okay. Um, the Kuros is, the, or the Kuro is, is more of a transition. Uh, yes, here we go. Um, now, 
this is interesting. Um, the Greeks started with the Egyptian uh, pro prototype because uh, they didn't, you know, they didn't really have anything else. Uh, they knew of the Egyptians. They had a, a seaport uh, that they that they um, uh, built uh, uh, in Egypt in the Delta region, uh, and uh, they were became aware of these incredible uh, works by the Egyptians, and they emulated them. They learned from them. The figure on the the far left is an Egyptian. You're very typical of what the Egyptians did for thousands of years. The figure in the middle is what we call kuroi, which is uh, Greek for male youth. And you can see how it's similar uh, the kuroi is to uh, the Egyptian model. I mean, just, um, mm -hmm. you know, the stance, the pose, the clenched fists, the one foot forward, the blank uh, facial expression, um, the hairdo even. Um, interesting difference is that the kuroi is nude which is relevant because mm -hmm. uh, the Greeks were looking yes. to the Egyptian model, but wanting to do something different with it. They wanted to glorify uh, uh, the heroic. Um, they wanted to glorify mm -hmm. uh, man as a capable being. But as you can see, that's, that's not satisfied. That need isn't satisfied mm -hmm. with, with the Egyptian model. So over time, over several generations, they pushed that model toward more realism. And you can see the figure on the right is a kuros that it, in there liberating the, uh, the, uh, are, you know, the hands from the trunk. Um, they're softening the forms, making them more realistic. And eventually uh, they, uh, they figured out how to make the figure look uh, natural with the contrapposto pose. And that was achieved in the uh, by Critias you know, with the Critias boy. And, and so you can see that they're not, the Greeks are not satisfied with sticking with a formula for 3,000 years. Within a fairly short mm -hmm. period of time, they start pushing the figure toward realism. And they had an, they wanted to glorify the heroic and they were looking to reality uh, as their inspiration. They were making observations and uh, and and uh, using that as the standard for uh, the work. And then, of course, the climax is the fifth century classical can, period. Can I just interject? Um, uh, yes. A question. The middle one is in the Metropolitan, right? In New York? Yeah, I think that's the uh, Met. Um, yeah. Yeah, I would show that. I would give uh, tours, art tours, and it's right near one of the entrances. And what I would, I was surprised it was Greek because it looks Egyptian to me because there's no gravity. I know. Gravity doesn't really yeah. exist. But then I take them, to, you know, 15 feet away around the corner and then show them the contrapasta that you mentioned and what, you know, the more advanced Greeks are. So, uh, but the, the, your your point about the nudity is that yeah the human body is something that should be displayed in its natural state and there's an aspect of pride there that we should not be ashamed which perhaps prior cultures and cert certainly uh, later cultures medieval cultures yes uh, saw and, and a see. shedding of uh, any kind of religious or court uh, protocols about dress <laughs> <laughs> They, right. they, they okay. wanted the figure nude and freestanding, uh, shorn of any, uh, you know, uh, visuals uh, relating to uh, a theocracy. But, which, and and mm -hmm. historically, uh, the Greeks didn't have a theocracy. They came out of their dark age, um, kind of a feudalistic society. They didn't have a priesthood. They didn't have kings. Mm -hmm. uh, their their societies were, were based on, on family uh, units or tribes, and that gave that freedom. And so they, mm -hmm. you know, started from scratch in, in certain ways, learned from the Egyptians, and then, and they took off. Um, yeah. So we can switch, uh, Elliot, back to the painting. So most of these are sculptures, just so uh, the audience yes, knows, the, the one Greek, painting. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. the, the heroic in Greek art is primarily uh, sculpture. Uh, there are a few, uh, relatively few paintings that clearly show us 
uh, the Greek conception of the heroic figure. In this one, we have uh, it's it's a, a mythic hero, Theseus. Uh, uh, he's about to slay the Minotaur. Uh, goddess uh, Athena is to the left, overseeing what's going on. Uh, but we see the hero fully on display. I mean, this this is uh, this myth, this illustration of a scene in, in a myth is used almost as an use by the Greeks to celebrate mm -hmm. uh, the heroic figure. Um, so mm -hmm. he's fully on what, display. He's... I'm sorry, I was going to say one point I love that you make there in a couple of these artworks, the heroes taming a beast, a wild beast with one hand, which shows like yes, a that's the theme. over... Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so we the, find the that scale. In, in the literature as well. Sophocles, Ode to Man, he is lord of all things living, beasts of the you know, land, birds of the air. Perfect. Uh, he right. he right. taketh with sleight of hand. So uh, you, you get this sense that they, they wanted to dramatize uh, superlative ability uh, in the way that these uh, heroes are are uh, either commanding or slaying uh, beasts or monsters, mm -hmm. and they're doing it seemingly effortlessly. And that you right. know, implies superlative strength and ability. And the scale here, the, the Minotaur looks like the size of a panther, not the, not the pussycat that, that the, the earlier right. <laughs> figure had captured. So it shows the, the, the enemy here is more, is more formidable than the, you know, the one that Theseus is able to conquer. And so it's more, it's more yes. heroic mm -hmm. in, that, in, that, in that way. Yes, and we certainly <laughs> get that kind of um, battle uh, of the protagonist uh, on the Parthenon uh, images. I don't think we have them here, the Metope of the Lapiths and Centaurs, but those, mm -hmm. again, they're, they're showing the heroes uh, grappling with one hand. Um, in in mm -hmm. some of the images, they're, they're losing, but in others, they're gaining ground. But in the end, you get the sense mm -hmm. of these you know, beautiful nude heroes. Interestingly, the heroes battling these monsters are nude. Of course, uh, warriors did not go into battle nude. So that's tipping us I off. Would, that this I would hope not. Celebration. <laughs> but that does, that well, does not sound like fun, right? No, it Going doesn't sound like fun, nude. but athletes <laughs> did. A yeah, athletes right. did in Greece. So uh, the next one I'd like to see, Elliot, if you could bring wait, hold up Hold, the hold on a second, forward. Elliot. Wait, wait, wait hold okay, on a second, because sure. I want to ask, I want to ask Sandra something about this. Because sure. also, uh, Athena looks very complacent. She does not look worried. You know, does not look at all right. like you know, like Theseus is is going to have a problem here. She seems she she seems very happy uh, with with this. Yeah, so she seems she... like a bystander. Like she's she's not you know guiding his arm. And this is another aspect of the heroic in 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 Greek art. The Greeks, you know, believed in gods. They're in their in their you know Homer. Uh, you know, uh, describes the interference of the gods, the plans of the gods, uh, and that's you know very much a part of of the Greek outlook. But um, what we're seeing here is a celebration of the hero's uh, effort. She is like a bystander. She's larger than him. I mean, she after all, she is a goddess, looking right. on at what he's doing, and he's doing it without her. her God. It reminds me in the in the Odyssey mm -hmm. when Odysseus returns home and he's got to confront the suitors as Athena who insists you have to kill them and you know, Odysseus is added to his can't I just kick him out of my house <laughs> you, you, you know I no. don't Athena <laughs> says no you have to kill them all you know and she's very confident that her man you know that uh, that that the Greek hero Odysseus could kill a hundred could kill a hundred suitors and of course you know with mm -hmm. her help he uh, he he does. But yeah, but but she's she's more of a bystander there, and Odysseus, like like in this in this work of art, Odysseus does the heavy lifting there, and, and similarly, the, the yes, yes, and it, yes, and, and Homer's uh, time was uh, you know earlier uh, when right. when um, eighth century Greeks, BC uh, mm -hmm. right. had yeah had mm -hmm. more of a, 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 a an attitude that the that the gods are in charge. Uh, 
you know, they're tricking man, they're making things happen that he wouldn't want. Um, but uh, as you saw, the arts progress through the fifth century, you're, you're seeing visions of uh, independent uh, heroic figures who, by all evidence from the, the work of art, suggests that, that, that he's acting uh, freely. Yeah, that's Regardless an interesting of, of point. Presence of the, of the of the gods. Yeah, that's an interesting point because Homer's roughly eight hundred BC, right? And singing eight, about eight, events eight, that were eight. roughly twelve hundred, right? The Trojan War was roughly yeah. twelve hundred BC. So you're right. The god, the right. gods and goddesses are much more involved in Homer than they are that's in this, right. you know, in this work of art. That's that's yep. an interesting point. Mm -hmm. And also, before we move on, Sandra, I want to ask you one other thing. But Athena, of course, my favorite of the. Uh, Greek gods and goddesses is the goddess of civilization and the patron goddess of, of Athens. And so the Greeks, yes. you know, in contrast to the, to the Christians who, who worship Mary for, because she's a virgin. I mean, that doesn't seem something that's so, such a great accomplishment that somebody should have to be worshiped for. But, uh, you know, Athena is, is powerful. She's brilliant. You know, yes. she's, the go, she's the goddess of civilization. So the Greeks, seem to have although they're much further back in time than the christians in centuries to come seem to have a much more enlightened view of of what females uh can do and can be yes. worship for than than the christians did we're going to get to that uh do you mind oh, we, uh, Sandra, oh, if you hold off for, sorry, for the sorry. week no no good uh, point andy you're you're anticipating us but we're there's a perfect uh, uh that you know there's a perfect sculpture that we'll talk about that well, whole, that's a theme everything. i really like in your book Sandra, that's a that's a real important theme, the male and the female. But if yes, I like to just go to the discus thrower because just, I just want, I just want to of, sing. Yeah, hold on, I just want to sing Athena's praises for a second because everything she stands absolutely, for as, uh, of as, course, as the goddess of, of, of civilization, by springs fully developed from Zeus's head. She has all of his wisdom yes. without the uh, without the, mm -hmm. the certain problems that her father her, her, her father had, yeah. right? <laughs> So yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Yes, so, okay. and she's portrayed as as elegant. She's not a mindless monster. I'm, I'm talking oh, about yeah, terms yeah, of the visual right. art. How she's portrayed, she yes. looks intelligent. She looks reflective. Uh, that she's you, you mm -hmm. almost sense that she's thinking about what's going on. Uh, so um, I wouldn't call the Greeks the first feminists, but they certainly had an exalted view of women. Uh, it was different mm -hmm. from how they viewed men. Obviously, men and women are different. Of course, if I say mm -hmm. that, well, we're going to end, but oh well. No, I'm um, ready. But I'm, yeah, you're going to get canceled, Sandra. She's you're going to get strong, canceled. Uh, incredibly <laughs> not strong here. and you, not here. No, not here. and exalted. <laughs> right. Yes. And I got to tell you, Sandra, I'm ready to sign on. I'll sign on for the worship of Athena. You know, <laughs> I'm, yes. all, I'm all. <laughs> In I'm all, Athens, I'm all there's a favorite. massive yeah. statue, a beautiful statue of her, and uh, right outside the academy that has Plato and Socrates, and there's one of Athena as well. That's just absolutely gorgeous. But let's move on to the discus thrower because the idea now mm. we're now we're coming to the ideal human. Now form. we're in the fifth century classical age. Yes. The age. Yeah. So this is the most current. This is the the closest to the present of everything we've seen so far. If we go chronologically. Yes. And isn't and, it shocking? I mean, he's almost shocking when you look at this figure compared to the three thousand years of the Egyptian mm -hmm. robots and the mm -hmm. uh, and the and the uh, the Mesopotamian uh, you know heroes locked in these positions. And then, oh my goodness, here you have man liberated. He's able to move freely. He's being dramatized mm -hmm. uh, in, in this particular uh, figure. It's, it's an athlete um, at the height of his abilities. Mm -hmm. It's an entirely secular subject. There's no um, uh, issue of, of of religious protocols or, or court mandates, this is this is an mm -hmm. in, independent individual man at the height of his abilities, doing the thing that he does best. And we yeah. and the and you talk about of the hmm? 
I was going to ask just you talk about motion and movement. You make you make that a point in Greek art. So you want to just elaborate? We could see this man is in motion. He is ready to. Yes, achieve. he's in action and, and his limbs penetrate. And, uh, you know, if you want to portray the heroic, you have to be able to do that. Otherwise, you're just creating something like an anatomic correct figure. This is, uh, of course, anatomically correct, but it shows it shows man in action, and uh, the the way that that his uh, uh, face uh, guides our eyes down his torso. It's like, there's almost a self-reflective quality to it, um, as though he's looking at what at his body at at the core of his body uh so the mm -hmm. the um this this is a is a i mean it's a perfect uh example of the classical greek treatment of human potential mm -hmm. in art and is this pl is the sculptor i mean the names aren't that well known but the only one i know is is it polycleitis is that the I don't know how to pronounce it. Oh, that's it, but, a different um, that's a different artist. This is this was made okay. by Myron. M Y R O N. Okay. Okay. And we Great. the only reason why we have him is because the Romans made marble copies of the original, which would have been in bronze. The Greeks preferred yes. bronze because with bronze you can create figures that are in action, penetrating space. Uh, who appear to be lithe uh, and and able to move? Uh, if you'll notice that there's a supporting stump that this figure yes. is attached to, and in fact, the tips mm -hmm. of the fingers uh, are attached. I believe there are pegs attaching to his leg. Of course, that wouldn't have been mm -hmm. in the original bronze. Uh, mm -hmm. But the only reason we have Myron's Discusor is because the Romans had him copied in marble, the bronzes for the most part down over the ages. They were recycled mm -hmm. for them, so we don't have them. Mm -hmm. We have a few endless rare war, bronzes that there. ended up at the bottom of the of, of the Mediterranean, and probably because I think in Roman ships that were taking booty back from Greece to Rome. Mm. Well, the, the contrast thousands here between... upon thousands of bronzes lost that way. Wow, what a shame. The, mankind's endless warfare and plunder, right? How, yeah. How, how, how many so one, geniuses one other... were killed too young? Wait, 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 wait how many yeah. geniuses were killed too young? How many great works were lost? But um, no. the contrast, the, yeah, the contrast, Sandra. Yeah. The contrast here the, of the is startling, isn't it? Of this. Yeah, yeah, between with the early uh, well, it was almost like beings work. from a planet came down and did this compared was the norm. And if you can imagine if back then, when this was entirely new, this is a completely new uh, revolutionary approach to art used to glorify. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the it's yeah, just the, the activity, the activity of it, the power, you know, the the dynamism, yes. potential, potential to human beings rather than the static, uh, stagnant form as we saw earlier. This get this this mm -hmm. is reminiscent of the quote from Antigone, you know, from Sophocles that you you, you gave before. You know, wonders was wonders yes. are many, but none none are more wonderful than man or. Or, or yes, yes. Like yeah, yeah, this, this, yes. this, and, I mean, and, this, this and along that line, it. we have to remember that this is conceptual. This is a conceptual work. This is not a portrait of a particular athlete on a certain day. This is a, a mm -hmm. conceptualization of human capacity. And uh, as far as the genders are concerned, uh, because this is a celebration of species, man, it's not even limited to the, the male gender. It's 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 a it's a glorification of human capacity. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so right. again, right. if right. we if we tie it into the distinctly human capacity, which is the ability to reason, as Aristotle identified a little bit after this, let's talk about how Greek culture 
the rational approach and how does what's the relationship there between their view of art? Well, uh, the Myron's discus thrower and, and works like uh, this were made possible by the philosophers in the previous archaic period, Thales on mm -hmm. down, the pre-Socratics, uh, mm -hmm. revolutionized mm -hmm. the way that humans think about uh, reality and, and their lives. Uh, they uh, broke from the age-old tradition of uh, religious authority and started thinking about uh, the world in terms of natural forces. Um, you know, they didn't get everything right, obviously. They, they had some, some wacky ideas in terms of what, what is the world stuff, you know, all of that. But mm -hmm. the, the method uh, was uh, this early effort at reasoning about uh, their lives and the world. And uh, so they were, they were uh, using firsthand observation and logical, you know, non-contradictory uh, inference from, from what they were observing. And uh, the artists uh, followed suit. And, uh, you know, that's what liberated art from the... Uh, the tyranny of theocracy mm -hmm. of the past and they were able yeah. to understand the human figure because they were observing it they were observing mm -hmm. it making firsthand observations mm -hmm. arriving at firsthand guns and experimenting in the studios and and this is you know, this was the reward that we all get from their uh, rational efforts that's a good that's a good philosophic point sandra because in, in the myths, you know, the human beings have interactions with the gods and goddesses. But in reality, nobody ever saw Zeus or Athena or had any, any you know, observation-based interaction with the god. Whereas Thales, on the other hand, yeah. is claiming all things, are, all things are water. You know, he's, he's, mm -hmm. he's, he was known as a careful observer. And he, he, he noticed, you know, at certain temperatures, water is liquid. At lower temperatures, it's ice. At higher temperatures, it's steam. It exists in all three states of matter. He noticed that all living things require water to live. Without water, they die. And based on careful observations, he reasoned mistakenly, but within yes. his con I don't even want to call it a context of knowledge. Within that context of ignorance, you know, when nothing was known, mm -hmm. it made his his conclusion made sense. You're absolutely right. It's based on careful observation, mistaken but careful observation. In contrast to the myths, which yeah. are great stories, but they're you know they're fanciful stories. Right. So you have a shift in orientation right. away from right. you know deities and um, magical forces, which was the primitive way of them before them, and focusing on uh, real life human and conceptualizing from that and so you right. have yeah. uh subjects like this which is a secular subject this, this is an athlete uh, he's not a god mm -hmm. he's not even a demigod like uh, he is uh he's an athlete they also uh glorified warriors soldiers uh you know and 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 the figures uh, by all evidence are not being guided by uh um, divine forces uh, and it re really it kind of cleared the way for artists to be able to think rationally about their work <laughs> perfect that's so why we they transition so now yeah, this is beautiful i can just look at this for hours you know i know i know we have some others enough. though that we do okay. the, sadly right, the show is not 16 hours so <laughs> we can't uh just uh so what's the next one that we're going to is it um uh, are we transitioning out of the greeks to the next uh phase well, i think the, we have been, uh, examples from the fifth century climax we have diadumenus um uh, Hermes, uh, I don't know if, uh, mm -hmm. uh, we have the winged victory. The now, she's is, from the, oh yeah, yeah so, the victory. So now, yes. He's also at the Met. Um, yes, he's at the, that's the contrast. Thank you. Cause I go from, he's 20 feet away from the other one, but around the corner. And that's the, that's the contrast yes, that yes. you're speaking about. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so he's in, he's another excellent example of the uh, classical, uh, the treatment of the classical 
the, of the figure in the classical period. Again, you can see these um, stone supports that which would not have been in place yes. in the Greek original. Imagine him without the stump, without the attachments mm -hmm. of the uh, hands and the, and the, the legs. Uh, and as the subject matter is, uh, it, it's a mobile pose. He's not, you know, swinging in action, but what he's doing is, is he himself. He is a, an athlete who is a, who has a match and he mm -hmm. is tying on his uh, diadem or it's, it, it's like a crown um, that uh, yeah. they had it. I was fascinated to learn that they crowned themselves, which in our yeah. Christian world mm -hmm. seems blasphemous mm -hmm. and, and uh, <laughs> uh, Right, narcissistic, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, inappropriate somehow that the victor crowns himself, but that's what they did. And we don't have the attachment uh, any longer of what he was holding, but that's what he was doing. And so they, they yeah. you know, this this uh, ties in with what Andy said about the nudity and and uh, mm -hmm. these these were proud victors and the. The, uh, the Greeks um, were very comfortable with their pride and dramatizing it. Yes. Yeah. I am, I am the greatest Muhammad Ali used to proclaim. <laughs> he, 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 might have, he might have fit right in, yes. you know, in the, in the Olympics. Yeah. Yes. The athletic and, competition. Mm -hmm. Yes. And he has this calm, reflective demeanor. So he's, uh, you know, he's not, uh, he's, he's not doing something that, that's considered to be odd or rash he is he's doing mm -hmm. something almost methodically and uh, we really yeah. get the sense of the intelligence here and when i i talk about the uh, the greek uh, works as being thoughtful athletes the combination of mind and physical mm -hmm. uh, excellence um, mm -hmm. uh, one of the ways that the greeks did this was by you know, tilting the head in this way as though uh, the individual is thinking about what they're doing. They're not gazing mm -hmm. blankly forward like the Egyptian and Near Eastern models. Yeah. Uh, they're thoughtful. Mm -hmm. And the way that the hands are articulated is all, also implies thoughtfulness uh, in the heroic. Mm -hmm. You can see uh, particularly yeah. the hand on the right, his left hand, the digits are, are cascading. Uh, in barbaric cultures, a lot of the figures had these paw-like uh, hands mm. with the, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, and there's no intelligence yeah. conveyed in paw-like hands, but there's intelligence uh, in these uh, articulated digits. And that's one subtle way that they conveyed thoughtfulness in, in, the, uh, uh, in the physical heroic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, and so He's a good example. you mentioned reflection in your description there's like a self-reflective aspect which again yeah, is implied. looking inward you know yeah it's implied and then also the good rewarded that yeah he won yes and he's rewarding himself with this with this laurel or this wreath or something i think at the met they have a drawing showing what the full thing originally looked like oh, so you could see oh. what what you know what it looked without like the, uh, lo yeah losing uh, the age but i the would other imagine thing about the, that the this... diadem was was in metal because they they did uh, mm -hmm. put metal bronze and gold uh, accoutrements mm -hmm. on their their sculptures right that's how we got the yeah mm -hmm. and that's how we got the 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 those terms for the olympics which you know the, the greeks uh invented but i think of michelangelo's david where you also you see the stump that keeps the you know his leg is keeps attached it to it because sculptures they can't stand the the weight right, right. um of the, the marble uh, so that's why they have to have that's these, right yeah exactly you have mm -hmm. to have it if, mm -hmm. if if the figure is in stone yeah and that's why the, the Greeks okay so love the bronze because they they had these they were able to make freestanding no limitation uh, figures right. without these mm -hmm. attachments it was very important to right. not have the figure attached to something they wanted it freestanding yeah that so that actually, shows the human beings and that shows the human beings independence in the, right? in, and individualism it too they, uh, yeah, right mm -hmm. yes yes it, it implies that and this is long before you had any thinkers 
actually explicitly writing about individualism. Right. Mm -hmm. right. It's amazing, though. I, I, you know, again, we're yes. talking about the relationship between the, cult, you know, the, the art and then, yeah, and how the ideas affect the, um, the art of the time. So, okay, let's move forward to um, post-classical Greece. And it's the Hellenistic, right? Um, yes, uh, there's a transitional fourth century, and then we head into the Hellenistic era after. Uh, and that's typically Lankun. marked that after the death oh, yeah. of Alexander. Mm -hmm. And that you would know, be just, uh, just... Laeco one. I'm sorry. You know, just something occurred to me. I mean, I was just thinking. Mm. And thinking's allowed, mm -hmm. right? When, when, when we're oh, sure. dealing with, <laughs> you, you, but I always tell my students that. But you're right. I mean, individuality comes later in history and independence. You know, earlier on, the tribe or the nation is is dominant. Uh, but I, I was just thinking, though, in, in, for, for example, in the, in the Iliad, um, by the end of the story, Achilles he, as he rises morally, because he was a temper tantrum throwing child earlier in the story, but you know, a powerful warrior. But by the end, he rises to this moral stature that equals his martial stature because he goes against all the mores of his tribe. I mean, Priam is in his power, right? I mean, Priam, the, the king of the Trojans, comes to him. He's it's, this is game set and match. This is checkmate, mm -hmm. and yet, yes. you know, he. He, he goes against what the tribe would tell him to do uh, by permitting Priam to take Hector's body and, you know, gives and gives him, you know, yep. safe passage back to back to Troy. That's a highly, I've never thought of it this way before. That's a highly independent act on, uh, on yes. Achilles' mm -hmm. part. And so, and so the great artists had this idea, at least implicitly, uh, you know, I, yes. think, yes. I, think, I think it's reflected mm -hmm. in this kind of sculpture. Yes, yes. And he wishes a Agamemnon was as good as Primus. Uh, pri uh, pri yeah, right? uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Agamemnon is not. Switched. Yeah, yeah. Agamemnon is not <laughs> you know, the, the not a true king in the way that Priam, in the way that Priam is. Right. So that's I interrupted I'm... you, Sandra. You were going to say something. Sorry. Well, I was just just adding uh, uh, any observation. I mean, the the, um, the heroes in uh, Homer do act out uh, uh, independently. Sometimes they're, they're doing things uh, because the gods uh, order them to or make, make certain things happen. But by and large, the plot proceeds according to, you know, at least his outrage, his decision to not fight. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's, that's an independent uh, uh, decision. Uh, so uh, I don't think we find anything like that in the um, uh, in the hieroglyphs of Egypt. Uh, we have have mm. it to some extent in the Epic of Gilgamesh, but it's it's you know he he is a demigod, um, so it it's there in Homer, and yeah. uh, and of course uh, it's trans in action. By Greeks uh, comported themselves how the philosophers proceeded. Um, mm -hmm. how the political leaders uh, proceeded. So the evidence yeah. is all in that, that they figured out, even if they weren't explicitly um, clarifying it in, in, in writing, that uh, man is an individual and uh, he has a mind and he has to use his mind in order to live. Yeah, this is a good point because Socrates... 469 to 399 BC is is considered the first great moral philosopher, which I think is is correct, a fifth century mm -hmm. BC. And his Socrates searching for definitions, rigorous definitions for moral terms and moral principles. And you can see that in, in already implicit in Homer. You know, the in other cultures, the moral is to obey authority, you obey the king, obey the pharaoh, you know, o, o, obey gods. But you already see Achilles acting on moral principle, not obeying the Agamemnon or not obeying the tribe in this. I mean, after 10 years of warfare, we won, we got the Trojan king, then it's over. But no, it's not the right thing mm -hmm. to do. You know, the right thing. Yeah. You, you already see the Greeks yeah. 
searching for yeah it's really it's really fascinating when you look at the philosophy the literature the sculpture all yeah. all integrates in you know in, in, in greek culture mm -hmm. it really yes. is fascinating really Yes, and, and so our the understanding of the art is is helped by knowing the this uh, wider context you're referring to. Mm -hmm. So, as far as artworks go, this is kind of the apex. So now we're going to slant downwards yes. uh, Fifth towards century. post, yeah, post uh, Greek um, yes, dominance and, in the uh, culture. And what's the name of the one that Ellie can bring up? Uh, Laekoulon is a good example of, of yeah, yes, we have. That's right. This mm -hmm. is a magnificent work, and all of it the is. knowledge um, developed in the classical age is, is being applied here. Uh, tremendous uh, figure. There's a magnificent view. Uh, Laekoulon is the main figure in the center. He, According to myth, he was a mm -hmm. priest who was punished for I think for warning Troy or something. Um, and the gods sent serpents to kill uh, his sons. So it's this dreadful situation. Um, but mm -hmm. the order of agony, the the pathos the uh, that mm -hmm. we're seeing here, uh, don't see in earlier classical work. Certainly there are, are you know bad things happening uh, to good mm -hmm. people in 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 some classical yeah. works but there isn't this sense of of agony agonizing mm -hmm. pathos this is really right. a magnificent man of of a of grand heroic potential in a in a diabolical world a, a world in which mm -hmm. he is he is being tortured and one can't think so of the one... worst torture than having your children destroyed. Right. Oh, yes. So that's, yeah. that's the, that kind of, and, and these, there was an, enough, this was not an eccentric uh, work. Uh, there were uh, a number of works, and historians call them punishment groups uh, that became mm -hmm. popular, uh, where man in agony is the dominant theme so uh, this this was a trend this was a cultural trend and not just an isolated case um this is very so one point you make i'm sorry i was going to say one point you make of in, the in, ideal. sorry mm -hmm. so you talk about um a focal point in an artwork <laughs> And I think this is a good example because first my eye goes to the, this muscular heroic man. That's like where I first go, but then I go up and I see his face and that's the contrast. That's oh, the, the uneasiness I get from this because why is this man who's like a giant physically muscular, yes. but yes. then in his face, it just makes me feel like, oh, this is, it's a, it's not the Greeks now. We're not in the Greek. This is not a discus thrower. Yeah. This is not an athlete uh, winning right. uh, and 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 granting himself um, a crown. Yeah. Now I can yes. I can I can certainly relate to this. You know, if if the powers that be sent these serpents to kill my daughter, you know, as a, as 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 a father, you know, it's just yeah, uh, it's just it's mm -hmm. just agonizing. You, mm -hmm. you, I'd fight. Yeah fight with all my might to save her but it but it doesn't look like as powerful as he is it doesn't look like he's he's got a chance to to save his children and it's just agonizing mm -hmm. anybody who's a parent can certainly relate to this and even if somebody doesn't have children they love probably love somebody you know and they can you know they yes. can relate to how a yes. parent loves uh loves his or her child and, and this, this, this mm -hmm. yeah this is you're right, Sandra. I've never seen this before. This is a powerful work of art. This is, this, whether I like yes. it or not, it's not the issue, right? This is a masterpiece. The way it, it the way it, 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 it is it, an absolute uh, masterpiece. Yeah, it, the way, um, the way it generates feel the feelings in, in the in the viewer in the in, in yes, the, in it's the more psychological than what we see earlier in the fifth century. Um, uh, protagonists, uh, you know, uh, figures in fifth century Greece who are dying. Or, or lost a battle, they're not portrayed with this of agony. It's it's really mm -hmm. psych 
psychologically um uh uh, uh the, the artists were psychologically aware enough to, yeah. to be able to portray this. And to, and to think that this mm -hmm. is important, you know, this order of agony is important enough uh, to and create in a major work. And of course, there were other punishment groups similar to this uh, showing mm -hmm. agonizing torments. So we're using so that word so much, I have anger. to bring up yeah we're using agony so much i have to bring up the, the awesome film about michelangelo the agony and the ecstasy and uh, you mentioned michael you there's there's um and, and irving you know, stone's we're, novel we're going Robert. farther irving, yeah mention irving stone's too. novel yeah yeah that's yeah, right of course yeah, yeah. but great, great now book. i'm seeing you know like what the referent is you know going back to there we know michael yes well was like michelangelo older, was present when this was on. Mm. so he was influenced okay. by laocon as well as the uh, belvedere torso which is a more is more of a mm -hmm. fragment but uh um so he right. um you see echoes of mm -hmm. hellenistic figures yeah in in uh, yeah. michelangelo's work I hope I've got that right, that he was actually present when they, when they, uh, when they dug this up. That's, that's amazing. That's my memory. That's, yeah. That, that, yeah. That's a, a so let's move on to the it, Romans. It, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Claudius. Uh, oh, so dear. Greek culture is going down. Romans are, ta Romans are taking over. Yes, the Romans are taking over. And they're looking to, they were very second-handed in, the, in the, at least in the realm of art. They um mm -hmm. i mean they uh art uh from, from uh greece they um had a uh, greek uh artists as slaves uh they had greek artists making works for them and here we have uh something they did it is it's so embarrassingly awkward but there's even sillier ones than this this is claudius uh, being portrayed as a god and as Jupiter and as you can see from if you if you don't look at his face which is a portrait likeness of Claudius the body mm -hmm. is completely borrowed from uh, the Greek heroic ideal um, you mm -hmm. have this magnificent torso and uh, the uh, framing mm -hmm. of the drapery and whatnot the the um, the stance uh, of the feet are, are much of this is ripped off from polycleitus uh, um, and mm -hmm. uh, and yet Claudius's head on. They even did things wow. like when when there was a changeover in power, they would knock the head off and put a new portrait head of the next guy. On. <laughs> and they did this over over generations to the point where they lost <laughs> a sense of the proportion. So you ended up with these uh, big, strapping, athletic body of them nude, with these yeah. tiny little heads on them. Uh, so mm -hmm. they really uh, were second-handed. Mm -hmm. uh, they really um, did on the Greek genius uh, to give them mm -hmm. art. There's something in this mm -hmm. that strikes me as incongruous, Sandra, is he's got his right hand out, almost like he's he's the head of a church, you know, seeking for donations, like he's like he's asking for money, he's asking for arms or something. <laughs> it, it doesn't go to me. It just doesn't go with a with a god. Uh, gods don't go around begging. You know, for yes, and I don't know what. Don't know what the, he's. He obviously has a mason in in one hand. I don't know what the other object is for. Um, mm -hmm. I, I I don't know that if would that's fit, something. But that would fit Christianity. You donate, or we, you know, we'll, you'll send right. you yeah. help. Yeah, that's. You know, you'll burn yeah, this is something else, and and I couldn't yeah, tell yeah, this, you what what that is. But, but, yeah, or, in a pagan in a pagan sculpture, it just struck me. It just struck me as mm -hmm. odd, or you know, it's jarring. It's to me, it's jarring that a god yeah. looks like he's begging, looks like he's begging for money. Yeah, so I wish I knew let's what move that on now. Meant. Yeah, uh, that'll be that'll be my homework. I'll look it up and 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 let oh, you it'll know. Be on but the let's. Yeah, let's move on to conceptions of feminine femininity 
and uh, we'll do the Greek and then we'll do the medieval. I think this will be a good uh, contrast here to show exactly, yeah, yes. what, again, the power of art, just visually looking at these two. Why don't you describe that? Sandra? Yes, uh, on top, of course, is the famous uh, winged uh, victory, beautifully displayed at the Louvre. She's from the Hellenistic era. I up think up the stairs, right? I love the way it is yes. up, up the, at the top of a staircase. So the way you yes. see it, it's like, wow, that is, yes. <laughs> it's impressive. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and the figure on the bottom is Eve, uh, uh, a, a Romanesque uh, relief panel uh from a, a cathedral uh in france and she's you know typical of the wit adam and eve and and others were portrayed in medieval so you have this, this um radical contrast between uh on top you have the greek conception of uh, of woman as uh strong uh she's wish we had all of her, but uh, we don't have her mm -hmm. arms or head, but we can see that she's striding forth boldly um, with uh, against a high wind that's whipping her uh, drapery. Interestingly, she does have wings. This is a trail of, of the goddess Nike, the goddess of victory. Uh, so we do have wings, which is a, a, a little element but interestingly enough the the female form is treated so realistically that we infer uh that the wings symbolize her ability we don't uh i mean you could ar argue this uh but, but arguably i think that the uh the wings uh dramatize human ability uh, not uh, divine ability, and certainly not as as, um, uh, as uh, portrayed in in Judaean uh, art. Eve on the bottom is slithering along uh, in him. She's accepting the forbidden fruit uh, from um, the devil. The devil's hand. It's difficult, a bit difficult to see here, but the devil's hand is coming in from the far right. Mm -hmm. uh, holding a branch down so that she can pick the fruit and she's whispering in Adam's ear. Adam is off on another panel to the left and uh, so mm -hmm. she's snake-like um, and uh, of course uh, she is nude but covered, her, her pubis is covered by, by, uh, by foliage um, and mm -hmm. if, if when you judge, even if you didn't know anything about culture or anything about Christian culture, look at these. And if you relate it to what you know about human beings in real life, you know that a figure that's striding in the way that the wing victory is, it, that is uh, um, a pose and a gesture implying uh, liberty, um, striding forth in yes. an open space. Uh, implying ability to to act uh, uh, freely uh, in the world. Figure on the bottom, we know, know what it's like to crawl. What <laughs> what would what would that be like for human yeah. being to crawl? What does that mean? Mm -hmm. And she's crawling through through. Um, uh, she's confined. She's restricted. Um, there are mm -hmm. barriers to her going forth in the world. So I mean, just at mm -hmm. that basic level. Um, even if we knew, knew nothing about these cultures, we'd have to we, we we'd have to wonder about what uh, what sort of view of of woman is on the bottom, and and what does oh, yeah. that imply? Mm -hmm. I want to go back. Can I go back to Athena <laughs> for, for for a minute? Yeah. Uh, what, because sure, you know, because you know, and. and the, the Athena is a goddess. She's the patron goddess of, of Athens and everything. And I was thinking about the contrast with with Mary, you know, the 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 mother of God in in, in Christianity. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Mary's is ver is virginal, which is um, you know, and the Christians worship that. And that's a and that's passive. That's about something that she did not do. Right? She did not make love to a man. Uh, was Athena, as I remember, is is often depicted as virginal virginal also. 
But yes, she's, Athena she's civil, of Parthenos. She's civil, yes. 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 Yeah. I guess her, her dad made up made up for that. But you know, regarding <laughs> regarding the the sexuality, but uh, but um, she's dynamic because she's civilization. She's wisdom. She's uh, she's you know she's she's the reasoning mind. She's very active. Whereas you know the the Greeks aren't worshiping a woman who's who's passive or a female. She's a goddess, not a woman, but a female who's uh, who's passive. They they're worshiping a female who's 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 enormously capable. You know, stands for stands for civilization yes. and everything that civiliz every it's enormously creative. All the things that civilization can create was was Mary gives birth. But, yes, I think she was also a goddess of craftsmen. Like Greek industry, <laughs> it's it's very it's so, very telling. Um, the, 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 very telling the difference between the two cultures. You know uh, the way they yes. what they worship in, what they worship in feminine about femininity. Yes, and and it's it's really uh, apparent in these in these two contrasting figures the the uh, winged victory. Um, she uh, portrays a goddess of victory. So she's an, a kind of value. She's an object of desire. People want victory. Men, men want victory in battle. And then she, uh, Nike, appears on the uh, prow of the ship uh, to declare her victory. And she's like a reward. So, um, yes, the Greeks. Uh, had these um, conceptualized conceptualizations of of women as strong, um, able, thoughtful. They were also objects of desire, and without shame. If you look at the torso of the winged victory, you can see her. Yet she's mm -hmm. she's draped. It's almost like a wet wet drapery, and she, her she's proudly displayed her feminine. Uh, anatomy is proudly on display. With mm -hmm. she is uh, uh, being covered up. She's uh, crawling along in shame, uh, as though there's something inherently wrong with being female. Mm -hmm. And she's not an object I found, of desire. I looked for my own, my own Athena. I looked for that I, that I oh. bought in Athens. So <laughs> Andy nice. made me uh, yeah, yeah, inspire me to go. Thumbs up, my, yeah. Two yeah. thumbs up. That. So but it's, let's, it's, let's but show. Let's me, let's me, wait, hold on a second. Let me just stay with Athena yes. for a second. Because it's striking. Mm -hmm. The Greek, I mean, you could have Apollo or some, you know, mighty god as the patron god of civilization and of the city that becomes the cradle of civilization. It's fascinating to me that the Greeks chose not a god, but a goddess. Uh, yes. You know, that, yes. that, that the, mm -hmm. view of, the view of femininity here is powerful, but not lethal or deadly eve is eve is like pandora she's opening up uh, you know a whole a whole slew of problems for for, for human beings mm -hmm. whereas athena civilization is enormous the power is enormously creative you know and construct not not destructive to human beings but enormously you know beneficial to human life fascinating to me that the greeks chose or the, the athenians chose a goddess you know as their you know as their patron God, rather than a mm -hmm. rather than a male god, I like that. I, I, I'm I, I'm all I'm all for it. Me too. But it's really it really me yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have another contrast. In the fifth century, you have the um, the emergence in Greek society of learned women. Prior to that, the um, mm -hmm. the female uh, equivalent of the kouroi was the the the, kor, the kore uh, the kora. Um, and uh, uh, they were heavily draped, very kind of sexless. Um, but when mm. uh, women came into their own as intellects uh, in the fifth, the artists uh, uh, stripped their uh, sculptures of females and, st and started to uh, dramatize the female form nude. And you know, that's mm -hmm. climaxes with the Aphrodite. Um, Mm -hmm. figures of fully nude but that didn't happen until women it was discovered women uh were smart uh prior to that in more primitive times you know the, the smartness and intellect of women was their intellectual capacity was not known uh and but once it became known 
interestingly enough, uh, the Aphrodites are, are made in, in uh, Greek art as fully nude. You know, my guess, my guess, Sandra, is that men knew it. They're just afraid of it. Uh, you know, they didn't want to, mm. they didn't want to, mm -hmm. they want to have to deal with smart women. Yes, but perhaps. A couple, couple of points you reminded me of. Aspasia, was that her name? Who ran a, a, a school in Athens, uh, I think in the fifth century BC. Um, you know, she was foreign born and she was a very popular teacher. She was a very, uh, very effective teacher. I think her name was, was, was Aspasia, uh, fifth century Athens. So you know, again, it's you know again not surprisingly, it's in Athens where you find you know a woman running a school, and her school I think was as popular as Plato's uh, as Plato's Academy was amongst the parents sending their, sending their sending their kids mm -hmm. there. And another point on this that occurred to me is um, it, it's in cultures that value the mind rather than brute force where women come into their own because then you know you know yes. if it's brute force if it's brute force males have an advantage but if if the mind course, is recognized yes. if the mind is recognized then there's no you know there's no gender basis for intelligence and creativity you know it's a, it's a human it's a human trait not a not a male or, or a female trait and when athens athens valued the mind and you see them venerating Athena, you see women able to open schools and run schools very, very effectively, uh, liberates the brain power of half the human race. It's, it's, a, you know, it's a great, great mm -hmm. advance. Yes, and, and I'd the, say the uh, complete contrast, the complete the contrast heroic, second. Uh, becomes less physicalistic, less right. Uh, levels, right. and more what, about what a contrast. In, intellect and pose and gesture and whatnot. I, I can see what, what you're saying. Right, Andy. And what a contrast! What, what a contrast with our good friends, the Taliban, right? Who, in the 21st <laughs> century, will put a bullet in a woman's head for the crime of mm. seeking an education. I mean, you're going back mm. way before the Greeks. We're going back to real caveman times. You know when you know when when, when we do yes. that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, one thing I like about Sandra's book here is you have a summary at the end of each chapter, and then you have some questions. So one question, mm. I think this is timely, is why did the nude, why did the female nude take so long to emerge in art compared to the male nude? I think you touched briefly on that, but you-, you Yes, know, yes, uh, if you look at the uh, chronology of the Kuroi, they're, they're, they're nude, uh, they're fully, fully nude at, uh, at a time when the female figure, the maidens, the, the Kora or Kore was plural, mm -hmm. uh, were, remained fully draped. And as, as I say, it's not until the fifth century and then later, actually uh, even more so in the fourth, that that the, the female form is, is realized uh, nude. And uh, that would have been for a, a number of reasons. Um, um, you know, as I say, women uh, were, uh, the knowledge of one's abilities uh, took time. And if you can imagine mm -hmm. a more primitive situation where the heroes are the ones who can fight for the city, who can fight it physically, fight off invaders, um, um, who are mm -hmm. excel at the games with, with physical might to be able to throw the discus the farthest and to run the fastest. Those were the standards for uh, the heroic. And um, <laughs> uh, I mean, it's not to Love, uh, but, but they they didn't know that uh, you know women were capable of of intellectual feats uh, just as well mm -hmm. uh, and had their own mm -hmm. physical abilities. But that that that's a perfectly understandable situation. Um, I mean, and and on top of that, um, I mean, before you know, really great contraceptive women spent a lot of their time in childbearing and child rearing and that doesn't mm -hmm. make for uh, a great uh you know care on the battlefield i mean that and that's that's just that's a fact of life uh, it, it's mm -hmm. a demeaning of women to at in in a collab to say you know it's it's it'd be mm -hmm. way better if you stayed home <laughs> And uh, yeah. did not go on the battlefield because if you're there, we're going to lose. And that's mm -hmm. there's there's nothing demeaning about that toward women. It's just mm -hmm. a fact. 
didn't have a, yeah. I, I don't think they had a heroic conception of woman as they so clearly with with men. And and that and that was mm-hmm. entirely understandable, justifiable. Well, you yeah. know, the Greeks had a lot of Greek mythology with the Amazons, right? This uh this race of yes, powerful they had a song, which war, is really war, interesting. warrior women. Yeah, it is. It is interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, you know, so let's and, move and, on and, to the. Yeah, I'm, so, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Robert. Yeah, I, I, we just have a couple more. I, I want to keep uh, just getting in all these works before before we wrap up. But the other one that has a contrast. So this one is the Crucifix and Hermes, which is even more dramatic oh, yes. of, of a contrast yeah, than right, the prior right, one right. because we couldn't yes. see Eve that well, but this one we see yes, this very is really deep. So without even saying. Without saying a word, we just look at these two. You wouldn't have to say anything here. It's just no. no you don't even have to talk. Just so, uh, look. Yeah. Dramatically mm-hmm. obvious. No, if if I had known zero about Christianity, this would be enough to motivate me to hate it. Yeah, yeah. This is uh, really a vicious. The the figure on the left is vicious, um, but that is the um, the Christian hero. Right, mm-hmm. he's an object of sacrifice. That's what the heroic is in 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 uh, this in this worldview, um, and compared to the figure on the right, which historians think represents a god, uh, the messenger god Hermes. Um, mm-hmm. I think the tip off are the little wings on on his helmet. Um, mm-hmm. Even though he's a god, he's entirely human. Um, He's yes. a man. He's 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 mm-hmm. not uh, a monster or or some ethereal um, you know, angel. Uh, he's a he's a he's a man. He's he could be uh, an Olympic athlete. Um, and the the difference between what what the 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 world outlook is on the left compared to the right is it's two different worlds. Mm-hmm. Two entirely different views of what the heroic is, uh, of what man's life on earth amounts to, uh, what the good life is. Um, yeah, don't need to say too much more. Sometimes the picture no. says it all, and yeah. that's you know that's yeah. It. Okay, <laughs> picture is worth a thousand you, words. I saw, I saw Sandra show this picture a couple of years ago and it just stuck in my mind so when we knew you were going to be on the program i was like we have to <laughs> share this yes, because, thank you for suggesting like i that. said you don't yeah you don't yes. need to say too much it's like two different sandra cultures. this which one yeah, do you want to this, be in also that's uh, yeah. my second question is which which world do you want to live in and yes uh, i know you, I'm, you're I'm absolutely right rain. robert you're absolutely right robert sandra mm-hmm. this country is stunning this, this, yeah. this stu- we don't need to say anything else about Greek, Greek versus. No. Yeah, you know, we could have done the show by this putting that up and then going and having a coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so let's come well, to yeah. more modern, uh, modern time. Is there anything else from, from the, from the, uh, back in the past that we haven't touched upon? We have, we have a, a humorous, uh, Final piece, but I yes, I we have a, skip a humorous we close. I, do you have the Zeus, the bronze Zeus of Artemision? The um, okay, uh, I love that. There one. He is. I saw that one, yeah. Mm-hmm. Now that's a rare original bronze. Yes. Now, there you have it yes. without the support stump, you know, that the Romans mm-hmm. introduced. Uh, mm-hmm. see how he penetrates space, he's. Um, yeah. You know, H- Homer talks about the heroes as magnificent as a god, and he's in yeah. this. This is uh, supposedly a god, either Poseidon or Zeus, but he's mm-hmm. completely manlike. He, he's hurling yes. something. Uh, we thunderbolt. Uh, he has fixed resolve, which <laughs> yeah, is also the way Homer yeah. Yep, he's thrown a thunderbolt from Olympus. <laughs> yes, it could be or a trident. We don't. We don't know. Um, mm-hmm. uh, he. You really sense that he's capable of throwing that at, at, a, at a far distance, and that he will meet his mark. And um, he's completely nude. There isn't anything about him that's supernatural or uh, divine. Uh, he's an entirely humanized type of god. Uh, I feel like he's mm-hmm. an, he's the artist 
sick for glorifying man, not for glorifying a god. It's really nice to see the original bronzes. He was found at the bottom <laughs> of the sea. Wow. Well, must, we, well, it must be, we must be Poseidon. No, it must He's going to be Poseidon, be Poseidon now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah right. <laughs> exactly, right. yeah. Bottom of the sea. Interestingly, <laughs> you can see the, the play had the eyes. They did inlaid eyes in, in stone and glass. So, And this uh, added to the, 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 the look of intelligence. Uh, when we look at the uh, Roman uh, carvings, you see these blank white, white lies, and, and, and it gives it mm -hmm. a, a blank mindless. But in the original Greek figures, you could see the iris and the pupil, and uh, so there yeah. there was a, a a greater sense of the in, of the intelligence of of the figure. There was somebody mm -hmm. home uh, in the original mm -hmm. uh, Greek uh, bronzes. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Well, sticking to the bronze, we have a twentieth century sculptor <sighs> of a. Fascist hero. Yeah. What the uh, 20th century <laughs> this national socialist. Like, this, this looks like Dolly this on a fascist. bad day, doesn't it? This looks like Dolly on a bad yeah, day. Yeah, doesn't that give you a headache? <laughs> it does give me a splitting headache. <laughs> it's so bizarre. Yeah, so it's, this is Mussolini. So this is the Italian fascist mm -hmm. dictator of the early 20th century. Mm -hmm. But Mussolini is coming out of Mussolini's head. I think the yeah. name of the title of this piece is Par. Uh, it was dated 1940. So this is Italian fascist, and of course the the German uh, Nazis, similar types of uh, propaganda yes. are showing the heroic as utterly physicalistic. It's just physicalistic yeah. might. Uh, there's there's yeah. a um, you know a mindlessness to that figure thrusting his mm -hmm. his weapon. Um, just looks like a brute, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. and they're copying the Romans the where they just what plant borrowed. Yeah, it's all I'm about sorry, warfare and conquest. It's all he, about warfare. I was going to say conquest. they copied the Romans where they just play, plas the, the leader's head on top of this, you know, physical muscular body. I don't think Mussolini looked like that nude. I'm just guessing, but I don't <laughs> yeah. think so. I doubt I know. very much that he looked like that. <laughs> I'm sure he um, wanted to, or in his dreams. Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's Arnold Schwarzenegger in his youth with a sword. That's but, true. Um, That's true. Just, 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 so, something just occurred to me, uh, comparison and contrast with Soviet realism. You know, the Soviets glorified mm -hmm. the workers that toiling in the fields. Mm -hmm. The Nazis and fascists yeah. glorified the warriors. And in, in, both, in both cases, yeah. it's physicalistic. It's they they, they both eschew yes. the mind. Yeah, you know, they're, they're not they're not showing yes. you know images images of Newton or Shakespeare or Einstein. You mm -hmm. know, your know, geniuses mm -hmm. geniuses like that. It's warriors and workers. You know, doing all doing. Yes. You know, it's all right. it's all physicalistic, and, yeah. which is appropriate for a totalitarian state because they're going to suppress any independent thinkers anyhow. Right, they're gonna kill. Yeah. Yep. They, you know, the Soviet, yes. Soviets would have killed Ayn Rand. The the Nazis would have killed Einstein. You know, so so yeah. you know, so it's 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 appropriate yes. given their sick their yeah. sick ideology. Yes, Elliot, let's yes, go back to is, the uh, discus throw. I can't look at this anymore. Please, okay. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Ah, yeah, yeah. Oh. That went back to heroism. Okay. <laughs> real real heroism, not the not the exactly, faux yeah. Nazi right. or Soviet mentality. Right. Real heroism. Right. Well, the mind and the body. Right. Right. That's right. Together. So, just a couple of things f uh, before we do wrap it up, Sandra. We talked about okay. Here you are an author, but as we can see behind you. Uh, there's an Ayn Rand bus that you've done that's very famous. Oh. And if I were to stay yes. in the, yeah, uh, it's absolutely wonderful. But if I stayed in the ancient Greek world, here is something from way uh. back when, a, a bust of Aristotle that you uh, did in, yeah, thank you, Elliot. Long time ago, and I still have this. I still look at it regularly. I don't have the, the real thing, but I have like 12 other Aristotle busts, but not... <laughs> Not actually this I have one. a bronze so, at home. A sculptress, author, such a pleasure to have you. Thinker, as Andy gave 
you know, several of your uh, accomplishments. Uh, please go out and get the book, Windows on Humanity, highly recommended, seeing the relationship between culture and art and the different cultures. And Andy, you have one thing you want to say before we uh, wrap it up uh, officially and thanks Sandra for being on the show. Yeah, so yes, Sandra, well, thank you for having me. Thank, want to thank you for coming on the show, Sandra. This was great. Uh, and so, you know, we recommend I really enjoyed it. book. Yeah, me too. Good. We, so we, we have a, a, another book. We have uh, Windows on Humanity here, Sandra's book, as we've uh, recommended. But also, my, my latest book, The Brooklyn Stories, just, was just oh, published. Oh, congrats, Andy. I, yeah, thank you. I just I just got this copy yesterday, uh, and if mm. I say, can I pat myself on the back, guys? If I say I so myself, can. yeah, thank you. <laughs> you know, like some of these Greeks, right? And like Muhammad, I'm, well, I'm not unlike Muhammad Ali. I'm not going to say I'm the greatest because I know, you know, I know I'm not. But if I say so myself, there's some very good. If anybody who loves literature and values the short story form, there's some very good mm -hmm. stories in in here. The subtitles, terrific are rousing, graphics too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, our good friend Bosch nice. Austin, you know, did yes, the, yes. very did, great, terrific. Did the art, the Brooklyn Stories, a rousing collection from New York's most colorful borough, and I think there were some very good stories that I'm very proud of. So, it's, and it's like you know, mm -hmm. eighteen or nineteen dollars, you know, from Amazon. So, so I just want to mm -hmm. plug plug my book as well as yours, Sandra. Thank you. Absolutely. It's so great to see you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you, Sandra. Thanks, thanks for everything. And hopefully, uh, sometime in the hero show is going to rock on. Hopefully, in the future, you yeah. can come back on. You, you know, to, to discuss. Oh, more and we get to see you to sign. Fast. We get to see you in person to sign your book for us. Okay, that would be a nice. Uh, you, you got it. Be a nice treat as well. Uh, mm -hmm. All right. So, so the uh, uh, Windows want... on Humanity paperback is at Amazon, yes. uh, or the uh, the hardcover and uh, superior the, hardcover. And the, mm -hmm. uh, it is at wind, windowsonhumanity.com. Perfect. Window, uh, thank windows, you again. On, windowsonhumanity.com. On thank humanity. You. Windowsonhumanity.com. Windows Great. All right. So, Andy, I'm not well, sure Sandra, Sandra knows how we salute the heroism, but this is, yeah, this is what we I, did to I Sandra to... and her book oh. and the Greeks. <laughs> yeah. Salute here to Sandra, to her book, and to Greek art. Oh. So, so yes. with that heroism, oh, oh, yes, Sandra, Robert, everybody out there in Hero <laughs> Land, I want to wish you to have a lead, lead a have a heroic day, lead a more heroic life, everybody, and we will see you it's possible. next week. Yes, it yes. is. That Sandra is Sandra shows that it's she yours. is a heroine. Yes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it is possible. <laughs> so we'll see everybody. We'll see you next week on the Hero Show.